and I'm so thrilled to be here with you all today. First of all, congratulations to your... <laughs> you made it. Not only did you make it, but you made it back. And today, first and foremost, is a celebration of you, of your hard work, of your triumphs, and of your talent, despite all of the obstacles that laid in front of you. You being here today is a demonstration of the single most important thing that we all need to make our way in the world, and that's perseverance. Some call it grit, some call it resilience, whatever you call it, you all got knocked down, as we all did during the pandemic, and you all persevered. Earning a college degree is a monumental accomplishment in any circumstance, but I can only imagine what you all battled to get back to here today. I'm sure it wasn't always pretty. Life got a little sloppy for all of us during the pandemic, and I'm sure distance learning was painful, losing out on college milestones was painful, and yet even though it all paled in comparison to the lives lost and the livelihoods lost along the way, your pain points were real as well. Because make no mistake, the COVID pandemic is the single most disruptive and traumatic event socially, economically, politically that our country has faced in all of our lifetimes. And we will continue to see it reverberate throughout your lifetime. So I think it's worth noting today of all days that life will continue to throw you obstacles. It's not a matter of if, but when you continue to encounter hardships. The real question is, how will you rise to the challenge? Therefore, perseverance is key. Throughout my 30 years at ABC News, I've traveled the world bearing witness to incredible acts of perseverance and fortitude, some of which President Harris enumerated. Hurricanes on the Gulf Coast, the earthquake in Haiti, gender-based violence in Honduras, and more mass shootings, frankly, than I care to remember. People often ask me, like, how do you keep your optimism? How do you keep your sanity in the midst of all of this darkness? And I often tell them that it's, it's times when we see the worst in humanity that we often see the best. I remember interviewing a survivor at the Las Vegas shooting, a lone gunman on the 52nd floor shooting down a barrage of bullets on concert goers below. And this one woman I interviewed had been shot in the hip. She ran for like a quarter of a mile with her family without even realizing she'd been shot. And I remember her telling me, I could not believe how many heroes emerged on the ground. There was one bad man in the tower and hundreds of heroes here on the ground. People who shielded bullets for strangers, people who turned gateways into gurneys, people who led other strangers to safety. And that is how I cling to the optimism and the deep humanity in all of us. But in this past year and a half, as we start looking at the pandemic through the rearview mirror, I think we can start seeing it as a gigantic opportunity for radical empathy. My whole career, frankly, at ABC News has been an exercise in radical empathy. Just to tell you a little bit about myself, I was born in Korea, moved to Northern California, Sunnyvale, which is now Silicon Valley, right? Um, it's now home to Apple and Google and Facebook, but when I was growing up there, Mark Zuckerberg was in diapers still. And there weren't a lot of people who looked like me. And I grew up often feeling other. I knew that my family's food smelled funny, that my parents talked funny, that my facial features looked funny to my classmates. And believe me, they reminded me on the playground regularly. My father, I realized as I was growing up, was often talked down to, right? Often emasculated and discriminated against because of the way he looked or because of the way he talked. And even though today I may present as a successful award-winning journalist, I still see the world through the eyes of that vulnerable immigrant child who didn't realize her family was poor, but realized that often her family was treated differently. By the time I made it to freshman year in college, you know, my well-meaning Asian American parents thought I should be an engineer. So I took, you know, a lot of engineering courses, promptly got a 27 out of 100 in my first calculus midterm. I'm gonna let that sink in for a second, 27. I also, at the same time, took a, a required political science class and aced it and got an A plus. And for the first time in my life, 
I broke the stereotype of uh, Asian American being good at math. That was clearly not the case. <laughs> I don't want to reinforce that women are not good at math, though. They are, just not this particular woman. And I decided to embark in a world of political science and journalism. And at that moment, it's an example of why representation matters. I saw a woman named Connie Chung, who was a prominent broadcast journalist. And, and when you see representation in, in, in the world, you realize that it, that person gives you permission to dream. And I hope that you are seeing people out there where you can cast your dreams into the future. I didn't realize as I set out on my journalism career that I was drawn to stories of marginalized communities, of people whose voices were often not heard. When I would go to the Mexican border and do stories about pe pregnant migrants and see little children that I saw myself uh, embodied in, every time I did stories like that, they were exercises in compassion. Which brings me to 2020, your year and this exercise in radical compassion. When COVID hit, ABC News went out to, to, you know, to the ICUs and interviewed the nurses and the doctors and the heroes who were sacrificing their safety and the safety of their families to help save lives. And yet pretty quickly, we started to see the racial disparity of COVID and the socioeconomic disparity of COVID. We quickly saw that there was a divide in this country between those who had the luxury of working from home and those who were deemed essential. Those who could socially distance in their own homes and those who couldn't. I went to the Bronx and interviewed a mom with six kids in a three bedroom apartment. She said, we couldn't socially distance, we all got COVID. She had six kids and two iPads and no Wi-Fi, and they were trying to distance learn. These are acts uh, stories that, that, that pr invoke, hopefully, acts of radical empathy. When you start seeing that death rates are dramatically different in these neighborhoods where that disparity exists, you can overlay a map of New York City with areas where essential workers live, the subway drivers, the grocery workers, the people who keep uh, the trains running on time. If you overlay that map with death rates of COVID, you see that this disproportionate impact was very real. And as we were seeing that racial disparity, we then saw George Floyd murdered. And I can say murdered now because Derek Chauvin is a convicted murderer. So we as a nation all saw that surveillance video. We all watched him murdered in front of our very eyes. When you see something like that, you can't unsee that. And as a journalist, we spent the next several months trying to place it into context, trying to tell stories. You know, I interviewed Breonna Taylor's mother. I interviewed Eric Garner's mother. I talked to protesters on the street wearing a mask, pushed up against police officers. We really tried to get at what was going on. And when I was out in the protests covering as a journalist, I realized that protesters looked like America. There were white allies, there were mothers and children, there were grandparents, there were black and brown folks, there were Asian American folks, there was the LGBT community, and everyone was engaged in this, as President Harris would say, sometimes uncomfortable conversation about racial equity and socioeconomic equity. And at the same time that all this was happening, we started seeing a dramatic uptick in violence and hate against the AAPI community, AAPI short for Asian American Pacific Islander. In many ways, the fear and the anxiety that we were feeling a year ago, that was weaponized against the Asian American community with words like Kung flu and Wuhan flu and Wuhan virus. It's the same kind of rhetoric that I grew up hearing on the playground that was weaponized against Asian Americans. You don't look like you belong from here. You don't belong here. And we started seeing attacks, a Vietnamese family in Texas slashed at a Costco, uh, a, a Thai grandfather in the Bay Area shoved to the ground and killed. And what, what were we were seeing in many ways with this dramatic uptick was this intersectionality of a lot of the ills that plague us all, whether it's poverty, mental illness, stereotypes, racial and racist stereotypes against each other. In so many ways, there was so much scapegoating going on throughout the pandemic. Now, I know that Union has prepared you academically and in so many other ways, intellectually, 
to succeed in your chosen professions. I have no doubt that you're well equipped. But I look out at you guys and I think of my own kids. My son's a sophomore in college, my other son's in high school, my youngest is in middle school. And as a journalist, I know that your generation is grappling with so much, whether it's just academic pressure, social media pressure, or just social pressure in general. I know that your generation is experiencing explosive rates of anxiety and record shattering rates of depression. And I remember thinking, you guys will very much be the perseverance generation, but there's a lot that you have to get through. And so I recently came across something that I hope will be helpful to you and I wanna share with you. It's five steps in enhancing well-being. Because again, I think that you guys are set on a course for success, but I want you to redefine success in a little way. It's not about how much money you make. It's not about the fancy title that you may earn or the next promotion, because trust me, if you are full of anxiety and self-loathing and unhappiness, it's not gonna mean that much. Psychologists talk about flourishing as a conduit to get through the trauma and the grief and the isolation that we've all gone through with the pandemic. This five-step guide that I'm about to give you is not my own. I'm going to cite it. Two very serious sources, the Harvard School of Public Health and TikTok. <laughs> More specifically, a random guy on TikTok who's opened something called Quincy's Tavern. He has about three million followers, and he talks about brain chemistry and the way that even though the brain is the most powerful organ in our bodies, it can be hacked, and you can unlock its secrets. So here we go. My kids hate that I talk about TikTok because they're like, mom, you're too old for TikTok. Um, but then they're like, mom, you're addicted to TikTok. So I've limited myself to 15 minutes on my screen, which pops up after I've been on. But like all sorts of social media, I tell them it's who you follow. If you follow toxic and uh, horrible people on your feed, then you will be fed toxic and horrible memes. If you like toxic and horrible divisive thoughts, those will continue to follow you. The algorithm is all knowing and we know that. Um, and plenty, and f trust me, as a woman of color and as a journalist, I get so much hate on Twitter. The internet, sadly, often rewards meanness. Just ask Chrissy Teigen. Back to my five little things that you can do. Number one, savor and celebrate small things. So let's do that now. Look up for a minute. Blue skies, gorgeous clouds, an iconic building behind you. It's the small things in life that we can cherish. The grass under your feet, the hash browns you had at breakfast. And what my guy on TikTok told me is that this is what unleashes dopamine in our brains, the reward chemical, the neurotransmitter triggered by acts of short-term pleasure, savoring dessert, checking a goal off, graduation, check, getting a massage. Step two in my five-step guide, practice gratitude. We can do that right now too. The diplomas you're about to be handed, they're your victory for sure, but you didn't get here on your own. You had parents, you had professors, you had advisors, you had friends who helped you along the way. And let's take a moment now to send gratitude their way. Of course, in the midst of doing that, your brain is producing oxytocin, the love hormone. It gives you the feeling of empathy and trust and bonding in social relationships. It is unlocked by socializing, by petting animals, by hugging and kissing and other stuff that we can't talk to about here at the podium. The third step in enhancing well-being, hobbies. Pick up or return to something that you love to do. Did you play an instrument in high school that you put aside? Maybe you can pick that up again. David Harris picked up hockey at the age of 35, and it's led to years of great experiences. I did the same. I started skiing for actually very similar reasons, I realized, because growing up a poor immigrant child, 
skiing was just way too expensive and out of my family's range. But as a 30-something-year-old and as a mom, I started skiing. And it's produced so much joy in my life. Those type of experiences produce endorphins, the chemicals our body produces to relieve stress and pain. It's literally a painkiller. That brief euphoria is brought on, and it's what opioids mimic, right? But you can trigger your own endorphins by breaking a meaningful sweat, by that runner's high that people is often elusive to me, frankly, because maybe I'm jogging a little too slow. Um, but it's not just about exercising. It's about belly laughing with your friends. It's about watching a fabulous movie. And during the pandemic, I picked up the hobby of gardening, which I'm told is a weight-bearing exercise. And it has helped me to get through the pandemic. And I think that we've all done things. Uh, my husband became a mixologist, which has secondary benefits for the family. <laughs> My youngest son found chefs on TikTok, and we all began cooking and connecting in the kitchen, which hits all of those, endorphins, you know, and, and oxy and dopamine, all of those things in one little hobby. Step four in the road to well-being, do good deeds. We Jews call them mitzvahs, right? And it's not just good to get into college, it's actually good because it makes you feel good. Serotonin is produced, and that's the key hormone for mood stabilization. It's known for long-term satisfaction, for doing good deeds. It also helps you regulate sleeping and eating. And it can also be unlocked by being out in nature and away from our phones, or through a cup of nice tea, or through mindful meditation. My three sons and I spent time delivering Meals on Wheels during the pandemic. And only one of my sons, the middle son, was getting high school credit. But all of us was getting the serotonin rush of helping others. The fifth and final path towards well-being is community and connection. Obviously, that's what union gives you. It's what your fraternity or sorority gives you. It's what your, your dorm mates gives you. The ultimate search for belonging and meaning in life is through community and connection. I'm here, as David told you, because I became acquainted to him with him a while back. And he's such a, a dynamic leader. And so when he invited me, I jumped at the opportunity, in part because my husband, Neil Shapiro, who's here somewhere, grew up in this capital region. He went to Bethlehem Central High School. And most importantly, both of his parents taught here at Union as adjunct professors back in the 70s. So in a, a very roundabout way, this is our communi community as well. His mom, Mildred, passed away about 15 years ago. Um, but his dad, Sumner Shapiro, passed away just last year, just before the pandemic. So we will spend the rest of today, this Father's Day, visiting his final resting place. All of it so full of meaning, full of connection, full of community and celebration. At 96, my father-in-law taught us all about perseverance, living through the Depression, fighting in World War II, and raising a family. Perseverance on the one hand, radical empathy on the other. Hopefully that will lead towards compassion. I mentioned that mindful meditation can boost the serotonin level, right? My mom, who's a Buddhist, has done meditation for, for many years. And she taught me about a practice known as loving kindness meditation, and she would it visualized each of her grandchildren as she meditated with a mantra. But I've since learned that loving kindness meditation begins with yourself, that you have to begin by being compassionate with yourself. Stop beating yourself up. Stop feeding your insecurity. I spent so much time after graduating from college being insecure, feeling like I didn't measure up to the people around me. Instead, I would encourage you to invest in your time and your energy in life's intangibles, in your spirit, in your friendships, your family, obviously, your community, and your talent. Because you might lose a job along the way, but you will never lose those intangibles, those things that matter if you nurture them. So I wish you congratulations. I wish you good luck. And I hope that this year has taught us all to be compassionate about our fellow man, to understand that there are deep inequities in our world and that you can go out there and work to be part of a brighter future. Thank you so much and congratulations.